Maybe I'll try that. Good morning, it's a um, beautiful day here. We've got a lot of action in the bee yard and we're gonna have to split some hives this morning. So I'm just setting up another hive and I thought we'd check out the base. This um, really cool base that we've got. I'm just setting it up now. We've got some Hebel block, this stuff's called Hebel. It's really great for um, setting beehives on. But the great thing about this stand is that it's got adjustable legs. So we could actually put it straight on the ground. It gets your hive up off the ground and yeah. you can get it level without so having to put, um, put these blocks down. It's quite easy with the blocks. So it's got two levels in it to enable it to enable you to level it easily. You can see this base, sorry, this back level here. It's quite easy to get your hive level. Just put the bubble in the middle and then figure out where it's rocking. This one is a bit short. So all we do is screw it down. And then it's nice and sturdy. Now we come around to the side here. And we notice this level has a slight angle to it. And this is to allow the base to sit three degrees sloped back towards the rear of the hive, away from the entrance, and it's for your harvesting. When you go to harvest your flow hive, the honey will run out the back, and the bees won't really even know. They just keep flying in and out their entrance. So we've got these two bubble levels pretty sorted now. This base is really sturdy. Now's a good time to um, fill up the ant guards. You noticed last week we had a few ants in our hives and well they're not in the hives I should say they like to sit above the top of the inner cover which is totally fine because the bees do a great job of keeping them out of the hive they can just be a little bit annoying for us as beekeepers because they sort of get all over us but yeah the ants love the warmth and the dry of that little space between the roof and the inner cover so as long as you've got no foliage contacting your hive, then these ant guards work really well on the adjustable legs. So I'm just pouring some veggie oil into the cap and pouring it into the little reservoir here, filling that up. That just creates a little moat for the ants and they can't generally get across there. just a bit easier to pour into the cap first. Um, what's, what works really well too is actually is filling up a little tomato sauce squeeze bottle with oil. And you can just squeeze it straight in. And um, this base is really great for getting your hive up off the ground and not having to um, mess around with getting a stand level and bricks and all kinds of things. So you want your hive up off the ground so that you can get them out of the way of land-based pests. Such so here we have a really bad problem with cane toads because the cane toads actually eat the bees. They will, if your hive's near the ground, they'll come up and knock with their heads against the um, brood box. And when the bees fly out, they'll eat them. The other things that eat them are large lizards around here, water dragons and such. And I know over in the States, there's quite a problem with skunks in some areas. If you have mice problems, you may want to get an entrance reducer. You pick up an entrance reducer from the Flow website. Um, that is a great tool for keeping mice out of the entrance. So we'll screw these top guards down. So that the bees can't get in the oil. Not that they generally do, but just so they can't. So that's nice and sturdy. We'll put our new brood box on and 
This is our new split box ready for splitting into. I've gone through some, I've gone through this row of bees yesterday and found some with queen cells. As I said, it's spring here at the moment and um, the bees are really on the move. So I've been going through hives and trying to find any with queen cells and trying to then go and split them. And we don't want many more hives here. So what I'm going to do is take some frames from this one and take some frames from that one and put them into the same box. And um, I've generally had plenty of success with that. I don't find the bees fight. So um, I just um, roll with that method. And we have queen cells in those two boxes, so I'm just gonna lump them in there and the queens can fight it out as they do. So I've got a lot to do here this morning. And the bees are quite stingy today. They're all on the move. So I do recommend wearing your suit and gloves. I don't really like wearing gloves. I don't mind getting stung very much. But if you're new to beekeeping or you might be a bit allergic, I really recommend suiting up and wearing gloves. Some people even like to tape, put tape around the cuffs of their sleeves on, onto their gloves and stuff like that. And around the ankles, which is a great idea. A little bit of smoke in the entrance. See you back here, lots and lots of honey and lots of bees. So they've got these three, well, these two filled and they're starting to fill out this back one. But I imagine this super would be quite full. If we look in the side window here, we may see some capped honey. Or no, we see brand new nectar which means it's all coming in right now. So they're on something. And around the other side. This is the beauty of the Flow Super, is you can really monitor what your bees are doing without even cracking the hive. Can't even see underneath. I'll just give that a tap, see if they move. So open cells, so I can see. So not capped yet but plenty going on. And as I said, there's queen cells in the brood box here. So we need to split them to avoid swarming. If you just tuned in or if you've got any questions, please pop them in the comments box and Trace will shout them out and we'll try and answer them. As I go through, oh yeah, that's really heavy, whoops. Lots of honey in here, super heavy. We'll look for the queen underneath on the bottom of the excluder. Can't see her, there's a drone there. So what I generally do is just shake them off so that there's nobody left on the excluder. When I go to put it back on, it doesn't matter which way up it goes little smoke just to kind of move them out of the way. Now I've actually, when I went through yesterday, I knew I'd be having to split, but I didn't necessarily have time to do it then. So I've marked the um, frames that I saw queen cells on. So I can pull those out straight away, but we'll also check because we don't want to miss any. Lots of drone cells there. What does that mean, Pete, if there's lots of drone cells? It means that the um, conditions around are very favourable for the bees. And um, they've got a lot of resources to be able to produce lots of drones. Now, drones, as far as we know, their only job is to mate with a virgin queen that they find in midair. So what happens is every day the drones from all the hives in the area fly to one spot in midair. We don't know how they know where that spot is. It's pretty incredible. 
and they just fly around. It's called a drone congregation area. And they're basically looking for virgin queens who, when they emerge from these cells here, will fly out to a drone congregation area and mate with several drones at the one time. So anywhere from 10 to 30, apparently. So, and then of course the drones die, unfortunately. It's a bit of a rough trot. You can see I've just grabbed a drone, a couple of drones here. They've got really big eyes for spotting those queens. They don't have a stinger. Because they're so big, they say that they take a lot of honey. They eat a lot of honey. So many commercial beekeepers kill their drone cells so that they're maximizing their honey crop. But we don't need to do that because we've got plenty of honey coming in and we need our drones to keep mating with queens. So here's the queen cell here that I spotted yesterday. You can see it's quite long, quite big, and I'm not sure if the camera can pick it up, but if we look right down in the hole, you can see, probably see, the larva of a queen. And just like a worker or a drone, this cell will get capped off and that larva will pupate into a queen. So this frame goes straight into our split box. Down here, might be doing some walking today between hives. This is a 10 frame brood box, so we've got room for 10 frames in our split. And the goal is basically to weaken the brood box of this colony and get rid of all the queen cells so that the bees kind of get fooled into thinking they've already swarmed and they stop the swarming tendency. And that way we get to keep our bees and they don't end up becoming a nuisance to neighbors when they swarm. So take the second frame. See lots of bees on that frame. If you do have questions or comments, please put them in the box below. Trace will shout them out and I'll try and answer them. Here's another queen cell. So I missed that yesterday. I was moving quite quickly. This one is just capped by the look of it. So we'll put that straight in our split as well. And we're always looking for the queen from this hive because it's really important that we don't put her in the split. We need her back in this parent colony. So have a good look for her. Actually don't have a cage on me. Oh, do I? No. Oh, I've got a small queen cage. Maybe we can use that. I do like to cage the queen when I'm doing things like that just because you know where she is and you can isolate her. So, can't see her on there. Hey Pete, if you've got a couple of queen cells that you're going to put into that split, does that mean you're going to end up with a few queens or what? Yeah, that's right. The queens, when there's many queens in the colony just emerging from their cells, only one can take over. And what happens is the first one out will go around and locate the others that are still in their cells by making a sound that the other ones answer. Oh, getting stung. And um, then that first queen out will go around and sting, sting those queens to death in their cells, through the side of the cells. Brutal. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> but if two queens emerge at once, they'll locate each other in the hive and they'll fight um, to the death, so they say. Um, our 
resident beast by Mirabai has filmed that. I believe it's, I believe it's on the Instagram page. I'm not sure where she's um, filmed two queens fighting. It's pretty cool. So I can't see the queen on that frame and I can't see any queen cells. So we'll put that back in the split. You can see how much brood this hive's got. It's no wonder they're swarming. Just got tons of brood. And we can infer from that that the population is gonna really boom. So we probably wanna weaken this hive down quite a lot. Sometimes it can be a fine line between getting a honey crop and preventing a swarm. Obviously if we weaken this down a lot, it'll be a lot harder for the bees to get honey into the super for their stores, but also for us as beekeepers to take a little bit. So I'll just put that frame aside for now because I may, once I find the queen, I may shake that frame into our split box. Pete, do you ever split a hive more than once in the springtime? Yeah, I have done that. Um, they can really build up quickly again if there's lots of resources. So here I can see a queen, the beginnings of a queen cell, it may just be a cup. The differences between a cell and a cup are not much, but a, a, a cell is going to have a larvae in it. A cup is like a little insurance policy where the bees have made it already and they can actually just herd the queen, the existing queen around and make her lay in there if they want to. But I can see a big old queen cell here. So we'll put that in our split. Yeah, so bees can build up really quickly after you've split them and depending on when you split them, I mean, it's very early in the season here. So we may end up having to split more than once. So I hope that doesn't happen because we'll end up with so many bees. I'm still looking for the queen. If I miss her, I may end up just having to leave a queen cell in here just as an insurance policy, which we'll just have to make that decision when we come to it. Just tuning in, we're making splits today. I've been through this whole row of bees yesterday quickly just to see if I can find queen cells and found some in this hive and another hive on the end. So we'll try and split both of them into the same box just to try and avoid getting too many hives in our yard. Not that you can really avoid that, but <laughs> we'll try and trying to keep it down if we can. I'm just touching these bees to move them so I can see what's underneath. You can also blow on them if you've got a um, veil on. Just ch touch them very gently on the back. If you've got gloves, that might be a lot easier to do. And the reason I'm doing that, I wanna see, I'm looking for queen cells, but also I wanna see their brood. But I'm also trying to make them run so I can try and find the queen in this box because she moves differently to the rest of the bees. Lots of bees on this comb. There's a little queen cup. You can sort of tell the difference between the cell and the cup. I don't think that's got anything in it. And there's some queen cells here that are just getting started. That one got a little bit squashed somehow. Sometimes the bees will fix that up. Other times it's no good anymore. So what I might do, I think we're getting up there in our frames. I might just take these queen cells and squash them down. So that's a bit brutal, but it's a thing that's kind of necessary. just to try and control that swarming impulse. Here's another one, might just remove it.
Just trying to find the queen, the existing queen in all this tangle of bees here can take a long time. It's always worth having a good look. If you do have any questions, please um, put them in the comments and I'll try and answer them. Still haven't seen the queen. I'll put this back and put it away from the other frames just so if the queen is around here, she doesn't climb onto this other frame that I've already checked. Just making them run again, trying to find the queen. Sometimes she can be underneath a lot of bees too. So making them move can just untangle them a bit. Sometimes you can really chase her across the box as you pull the frames out and she runs away from the light. There's a big queen cell there. Wow, there's lots in this lots one, Pete. Lots and lots. I may just pull that down. You can actually eat the royal jelly that's in the bottom of these if you want to. It tastes pretty sharp, but apparently it's really good for you. <laughs> so I can see a lot of eggs in these blank cells. It might be hard for the camera to pick up, but um, if you were splitting your colony without queen cells, then you would want eggs in your split so that the bees in your split can make queen cells from those eggs. They actually make them from very, very young larvae that have just hatched out of the eggs. Um, but it's the safest thing is to just spot the eggs and put them in, put the frame with eggs into your split. But today we're splitting with lots of queen cells, so we don't need eggs in our split. You can see that bee actually licking up the royal jelly that I've squeezed out of that destroyed queen cell, another one. So royal jelly is a very bee hormone rich substance. And it's the reason that a normal worker larvae can turn into a queen. So what happens with very young larvae is the worker bees feed them royal jelly for the first three days of their life. Then they switch them to bee bread, which is fermented pollen. And that's their protein source, which they grow on. But when the bees are making a queen, they will actually feed that young worker larvae royal jelly for the whole time until it's capped off and pupating and they'll sit that larvae in a really 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 thick deep pool of royal jelly in the cell that's another reason why the queen cells are so large it's because they contain a lot of royal jelly and that royal jelly is the difference between that young larvae's or larvas ovaries developing or not. So we can actually think of every single worker in here as a stunted queen in a way, because they all start off the same. It's quite fascinating. So I wonder why some get, why do they all choose the same one, Pete, to then become the queen? Is it she the bossiest one or she's the biggest one? Or she's got a big crown? Or... <laughs> yeah, she's got a little tiara. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think we know how they choose which larvae to make into a queen. They generally choose very, very young larvae that have just hatched out. And I believe that they choose cells that are... Um, got a waggle dance there? No. Or did you see the queen, Callum? Yeah. You did? Yeah. She went through. Oh. Nice spotting. Callum, Callum spotted it. behind the camera. There she is. Nice one. Nice one. There she is. Good job. She's um, a little bit small, but that doesn't mean she's not doing an amazing job. You can see this hive is really, really healthy. I'm just touching the bees around her to make, her, make them move so we can get a good shot. It's a beautiful colour. 
So I'm going to just stick her back into the hive. Let's stick this frame back in the hive. I can't see any queen cells. I can see some cups. I'm just going to squash them. There's nothing inside them. So you can, if you want to, do a reverse style split where you leave the queen cells in the hive and take frames with the parent queen and put them in your split. It all depends on what you want to do and what you're trying to do. But that's definitely a possibility too. And that's just all drone, drone comb. You can see the different sizes to the worker cells. These are much bigger. They've got really convex capping. So here's the worker, the capped worker brood that's all pupating bees under here. So you can see the hexagons are quite delineated in the caps between each cell, but in the drone brood, the cell sizes are much bigger to fit the bigger drones and the capping really pops out. Lots of drones in this hive. Just trying to find all the little queen cells or queen cups and just take them down. Just trying to avoid the bees from swarming or try and discourage them from doing it. Sometimes it can be really hard to stop once they're in this mode. So we've got four frames down here. We've got another frame that I lent up against the side. I'm going to shake all these bees in and put the comb back. Actually, no, I might put this comb straight in. We know the queen is in the parent colony, so we're all good there. The more bees in you split, the better really, because there's sort of, there's two ages of bees. What happens is when bees emerge from their cells and their life starts as an adult bee, they stay in the hive for three weeks and do a bunch of jobs inside the hive. So they've never been outside. They don't know where they live, basically. And then when they get older, they graduate to become field bees and they forage for food. So they geolocate to their, their spot. So what happens is what we call the young bees, the nurse bees, they stay on the combs. They don't fly back to their old hive, but the forager bees, when they fly out to get food, they'll return to their parent colony because that's where they're geolocated to. So the more nurse bees we can get in our split box, the better. And if you are splitting, sometimes a good trick is to actually swap the boxes over. So the parent colony goes into the new spot you get all the returning foragers to your split and that just really boosts them and gets them going. So we'll leave that for now. We'll split another hive into there. We've got four blank frames to replace and we'll go to our next colony. So in springtime, you don't want to do this any other time, but in springtime you can do what's called checkerboarding in the brood nest. Um, where you split the brood nest up. It really makes them draw comb fast. So you can sort of put an empty frame in between. It can also slow them down from laying a little bit more and getting, building up too quickly. But as I said, only do it when in spring when the hives are swarming and there's tons of resources because the bees and the weather's warm because the bees will cluster on the brood to keep it warm and if you split up the brood nest like this then it's harder for them to keep the brood warm. So I'm just gonna put that in the middle that will really encourage them to draw those frames out quickly. The other benefit of it is that if you put two blank frames together and the bees can draw across the two frames, draw the comb across the two frames and when you pull them out it can be a really big sticky mess. So we've got walls on each side of the blank frames for them to adhere to. And just can lever off the side of the box here. I've got all the frames together. These sidebars are all touching so we don't squash any bees when we try and lever them into the middle.
queen excluder and all these bees because I put the super on its end all the bees cluster up so we've just got to move them back up into the super before we put them back on just a little smoke we'll get them running back up there we go and always trying not to squash bees sometimes it's very difficult especially when the super's heavy like this one and just slide it around on the excluder a little bit try and get it back in whack there oh. cool so you can see this is a western red cedar hive and it's completely unfinished even the roof's unfinished and it's gone a really nice kind of shade of silver here and a cool kind of mottled timber look and the red cedar holds up really really well in the weather if it's not finished as you can see we do recommend painting your roof shingles. But the red seed is an amazing timber. So um, we'll go over here to the next one. I've put a rock on the roof so I know which one to split. And you can see at the entrance here, it's really busy. Now in springtime you may even see your, be your bees bearding up here and hanging off the entrance board and that is to just so many bodies in the hive they come out especially when it's a hot day they'll come out and hang they'll kind of cluster up on the box like that that can be a real sign of swarming but it can So if you do see that them doing that, you look in your brood box, see what's going on. So Pete, you're going to take some frames out of this one and put them in the other box. So it's okay to mix and match your brood frames. Many beekeepers say that it's not, um, but I've had plenty of success with doing it. And many beekeepers say that the bees will fight. Um, I've never really seen that, so. I've kind of just, it's all been um, My reasoning for doing it is just to avoid having too many hives yeah, right. in our apiary because yep. as you can see, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of wondering if you can just knock off the queen cell, which is what you were doing, um, and then just swap out an old frame for a new frame to give them more room without having to actually end up with another hive. You absolutely can do that, it's really good um, advice. You just do want to be careful that you make enough space that they will stop their swarming tendencies because what can happen is you knock out all the queen cells and they just build more, even though they've got a bit of room in their nest. So you just want to make sure that you do give them a lot of room. Um, definitely a good way of doing it. You can see these drone cells under the queen excluder here. They've built them that way. They're kind of cool to see. You can sort of see the top of the cells. They look a little bit like queen cells, but because they're so straight and because there's so many of them clumped together, they're, they're drones. You can see one I've accidentally pulled apart here and just see the eyes forming. I can see here that one is definitely a queen cell. You can see how it droops down in between the frames there. So we might destroy that straight away because it'll probably get destroyed anyway. And I didn't mark any of these frames but I just put a rock on top of the hive to show me that I had queen cells in here. And this looks like it's a new frame. So I guess this is what can happen too, because this hive's obviously been weakened down in the past, and they've just, you can see the whiter the wax, the newer it is, and then in the middle it's a bit yellow. Hasn't had a cycle of brood through it yet. You can see some eggs down in here. So the queen's laying drone eggs 
in these cells. Now the reason they've drawn this size cells is because at springtime they want all these drones because the drones are the ones that will propagate the genetics of this hive out into the world. They're the ones that fly out and mate with, the, with virgin queens. So they kind of spread the genetics around and in the springtime hives will make a lot of drones purely for that reason. The queen's right on this frame, which is great. And she is there. She's a beautiful color too. She doesn't have that black coloring, just a little bit on the tip. And you can see she's sticking her head down cells, wanting to um, investigate them for laying. So I wonder what we might do with her. Maybe we can pop her in a cage Do you I need a cage, just, Pete, or are you okay? Um, I'll just use this little, this is a cage for, it's just what I had in my pocket. It's an old cage for releasing a queen into a colony. It's like requeening a colony. Usually you put candy in here, in this little tube. I'll just put some wax in here. This is not what you would usually do. I'm just kind of improvising here. <laughs> just so she can't get out. I could just leave her on this frame and put her on the side of the box here. But um, I might just try and find her again. <laughs> we'll see what happens. It may take a little while. Maybe I'll just leave her on this frame. There she is. So you can just grab a queen by the wings if you really don't leave her by the wings too long. So I just popped her in this cage and there she is. You just have to be really gentle. If you want to practice grabbing queens, just start grabbing, start by grabbing drones because they don't have a stinger and they are a little bit expendable, not like a queen. I don't want to say they're expendable, but they're less valuable to your colony than a queen. But the most important thing is they don't sting. So we're looking for queen cells. Now that we've found our queen, it's really great. It'll make it really quick and easy to be able to split. And see this little band of wax down here. It's, it's almost like the bees stop using it they sort of propolize it up. It's kind of unusable to them. They just won't use that real estate. I'm not sure why that happens, but it tends to happen on, out on side frames a little bit. The comb just becomes old and dark and then they sort of don't use it. Well, I can't see cells on this frame. There's a cell there. I'm not sure if it's got anything in it or not. I can't quite see up in it. I don't think it has actually. No, it's just a cup. So I just widened it out there. You can see the camera pick it up and see there's nothing in there. So if you, if you do want to check what's going on, you can just try and get the light down into the cell and see if there's a larva or an egg in the bottom of it. Just looking for queen cells. Lots of brood on this frame. If you've got questions, please put them in the comments box and trace all them. Um, call them out. I'll try and answer them best I can. Lots and lots of brood here. So we're splitting colonies today as part of spring swarm management and we're just splitting straight back into our apiary. I'm splitting two parent colonies into the one box 
just to avoid a buildup of hives. And like somebody said in the comments, you can pull out honey frames and weaken your colony by pulling honey frames out of your brood box and replacing them with blank frames and pulling down any queen cells you see. Got a broken frame here. Just quickly fix that. Just bang it back in. When I make brood frames, I usually like to put a nail through the sidebar and that prevents this top bar from coming out. I also use some glue. And so you can also add a second brood box or another super and give the bees lots of room that way. Um, it's all about space management really. However, when you see queen cells in your box in springtime, the swarming tendency can be difficult to stop because it's their natural behavior. And once they get on that roll, they really want to keep going through it. So if you do see queen cells, you really want to make sure that you fool the bees into thinking they've already swarmed by pulling down the cells and giving them more space or taking those cells away in the frames and putting them in a split box like we're doing. Um, another way you can manage it too and buy yourself more time is to harvest your super if it's full. It doesn't always work but it can be a form of space management because it basically gives the bees space straight away. So you can see this is a new comb too that's been put in. As I said before, this hive at some point has been weakened out, maybe a month ago, and new frames put in. And the bees have drawn it quite quickly and they've drawn drone sized cells to make drones going into spring. Got a little ball of bees here. When they're balled up like that, you can kind of, <laughs> you can, they'll just kind of run like liquid a little bit and then flick them off if they're nice. This colony is fairly nice. So I'm still looking for these queen cells. I may have, I was going very quickly yesterday, so I may just kind of have um, fooled myself here, but we'll see anyway. Lots of worker brood, lots of drones, lots of nectar. You see this liquid nectar, you know that it's coming in right now. So I know you're right here, the palms are in flower just up there. The bees are working the palm flowers. They love those flowers. There's also a sugar maple up the top that they really love. And down in the valley, maybe you can see all those rows of trees. They're macadamia nuts and they've just come into flower. So the bees, really love them and I'd say they'd be really getting on those flowers. It's not that far for them down there to fly so they're probably going down there and macadamias are a really common crop for Australian beekeepers, a honey crop. Lots of drone cells in this comb. The other thing is, is it's quite easy to miss queen cells when you're going through. So hopefully I haven't missed any. I think that one on the top of the frames that I saw when I pulled the queen excluder off may have been what I saw when I was going through. So going through yesterday. So we'll see what's on this last two frames, but I think we'll split them anyway. We're just looking for queen cells. So we'll put this aside and go into the split. No queen cells on there, but we still need to weaken the colony because of that queen cell on the top bars of the frames there. So that's just a big frame of pollen, lots and lots of pollen in there. And that's great. Lots of different colors. It means the bees have got a varied 
diet. So that's what's called bee bread in there. The bees walk around on the flowers when they're going to get nectar, which is which they turn into honey. And the pollen, which is the dust on the flowers, gets caught in all their hairs on their body. The bees have got three million hairs or more all over their body, even on their eyes. And the pollen just gets caught up in those hairs and the bees then brush them off with their legs and put them into little balls on the back of their legs, which they then bring home. I'm just seeing if we can see some down at the entrance. Not a, oh yeah, there we go. There's one with some pollen balls. A yellow pollen on its legs. And the bees then go in and brush those off into the cells. Other bees pack those little pollen balls in with their heads, put some saliva and a little bit of nectar in there, and they build that pollen up. And it ferments with the saliva and nectar and breaks down a little bit better for the bees to be able to digest. So we might put this frame in the split, a little bit of brood, a bit of pollen. We might see if we can find some honey. We'll put these two in. Now we've, fi we've found the queen in there and caged her up, so that's great. We won't be putting her in the split accidentally. So you can see our split bees, they're just hanging out. They're just a little confused. They'll probably go, probably start getting a little busy when they meet each other. But I haven't really seen them fight, but it is a thing that beekeepers do talk about. And see them sort of in confusion a little bit. We might go and get some more frames and fill this box up. Lots of young brood on this frame and some capped brood as well. It's a good frame for our split. And probably last one, I'd say. Oh yeah, that's a great one. So that'll get our split going really well. By putting all these frames in with, uh, with the queen cells and everything and filling up this box, does that mean you'll have to go in and split this box soon? No, or will you just add the super? Probably not, yeah, I'll just add the super. It might take them a little while to, for the queens to emerge and then for them to mate and then, the, uh, or, or for one to mate, sorry, and then get established and start laying. So we will see a sort of a, a plateau or a, even a drop in population while that happens. While that happens though, there is capped brood that's emerging that will kind of continue to regenerate the population of the hive. But then, yeah, obviously you can add your super when it gets really busy and we're gonna give it some blank frames too. So we'll give it two blank frames and that'll also just give them some work to do. Gosh, it made, made me realise, Pete, I did a split on my own hives, but I shook, I, it made me realise how I might have done it all wrong, because I shook the bees off the brood frames, because I couldn't spot the queen, oh. and so then when I put them into the hive, there's probably hardly any bees in there. Oh no, maybe you want to swap the positions of your boxes, Trace, so that you can get all the returning forager bees back oh. into your split box. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oops, I should be watching your videos more often. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a method, um, I believe it's, I did it maybe last spring. Um, I'm not actually sure what it's called, but it's a, 
a method that commercial beekeepers use a lot because you don't have to find the queen and it's quite quick. So I'll just quickly go through it. You use an excluder and a second brood box. So I'll just demonstrate here. What you do is pretend this is the parent colony. You go through and you, sh you just shake all the bees off the frames that you want in your split. So lots of open brood, eggs, a little bit of cat brood, a little bit of honey. Just shake them all off into the brood box so you know your queen's downstairs. Then you put your queen excluder ah. over the top. And you, sorry, and then you put them in your new box. Put those frames in your new box. There's no bees on them at all. Put your queen excluder over your brood box with all your bees and the queen down here. Queen excluder on. New split box with frames goes on here. Your frames that you want in your split goes on here. All the nurse bees will come up through the queen excluder because they'll smell that brood that's in your new split box. So they'll come up and then you come back the next day, take that box off, leave the queen excluder down there, put your new box on a, on a bottom board and then that's your split. You know the queen hasn't got in there because you've shaken her down and she can't get back through the excluder. Hopefully that makes sense. It, oh. It's a little bit complicated no. without showing it, but there is a video of it on our channel. It, it does, Pete. Would the other option be if I sort of did it completely wrong, which I obviously have, could I just go into my hive and take out a frame full of bees and then put that in now, even though it's like almost a week later? Yeah, absolutely. So I could do it that yep. way as well. And you can also go and shake nurse bees off the brood comb from your parent split. Uh, Sorry, from your parent colony into the split. Yep. And you want to make sure you find the queen before you sta start shaking bees in though. Yeah. That's which is the, always the tricky thing. That is the tricky bit. But you could do that method, Trace, if you wanted to, yeah, where you like shake that. all the bees off, put them in a top box over an excluder. Yep. Come back and then you can actually just shake the nurse bees off into your split if yeah. you want and put that frame back. That would work. Would you, would you put your super on top or just leave it off while you're doing that process? Oh, you could put it on top of that second the brood box. The whole pile yep. and do it like that. Yep. Yep. Mm, I've got a bit of work this weekend then. Be work. <laughs> hey, have you ever seen a drone congregation in action? I, I haven't, unfortunately. Um, I know Mirabai has. She, I believe she's filmed it, I'm not sure. Um, there's one down near Cedars Apiary, but I've never spotted it. So he's spotted it a bunch of times. Um, I've seen it on video, which is really amazing. There's a really great video on YouTube too. I think it's by National Geographic of, it's like close-up shots of a queen flying and drones mating with her. And it's just brilliant. So try and search that up if you can. Maybe we can link it. I'm not sure, Trace, can we do that? Um, yeah, I'm sure Leah will be able to do that. Absolutely. Cool, because it's really, really interesting to watch. Yeah. So we'll keep moving through here well, we'll just replace these blank frames now i've got a, like a bit of a decision to make here these bees didn't have tons of queen cells they just had the one so we may not split the brood nest up i think here i just wanted to split them to be safe Put the queen back over there. You can see all the bees smelling her and wanting to tend to her. They can still get to her through those holes. Only just, you don't want to keep her in there for too long. Usually that's how, if you buy a queen from a queen breeder, that's how the um, queen, bree, queen bee will get shipped. Usually there's a plug of candy made from sugar in here and some attendant workers in with her inside and they'll look after her needs while she gets shipped to you and then you put it in put the cage in to your queenless colony and the bees will chew through that candy it's like a slow release mechanism where once they've chewed through the candy it takes a few days they'll be already used to the new queen smell and they'll be more likely to accept her so it's not really a cage that you should use just to kind of catch the queen while you're doing a split it was just what was in my pocket so i'm just kind of improvising but we might release her in a sec we might just put these blank frames in i 
I'm gonna put one on the edge. Put one there. Watch out. finger in the wrong spot. There she goes. Whoa. <laughs> nice and fast. Okay. Try and drive these guys down so they get out of the way. I might scrape this comb off a little bit. Oh, actually there's a lot of drone cells in here. Maybe we'll just leave it alone for now. I'll look for any queen cells on this excluder. That might be one. I'll squash it down. Um, this is not a flow excluder, this is just on for an experiment. And we'll just smoke these bees back up into their super and we'll pretty much be done. If you do have any more questions, please put them in the comment box and we'll endeavour to answer them. Super's pretty heavy. <laughs> Oops. Um, if we've got time, we may go and check out our split we made two weeks ago. I wonder how we're doing for time. Um, it's almost 11, Pete. I think we're okay. Do we have enough time, Callum? Sure. Sounds good. Let's go and check it. We'll see what we can see. Last week, Cedar checked it and there was some queen cells in there. So we split that colony just as some swarm prevention without there being any queen cells in the parent colony. And we just need to go and check it to see what we see. We need to just monitor our splits to make sure they become queen right and can then be colonies on their own. So you can see in the meantime, the population is fairly low because as the older bees sort of die off, the population starts getting a little lower. They're just drawing a little tiny bit of comb there. It's really cute. Start of some comb. And that's how they do it. They just start with that tiny little bit. Sometimes they draw like four or five of those or two or three and they join them all together. We'll just have a really quick look in here. Maybe we'll spot a virgin queen. They're quite difficult to spot. They look really, really like work of bees because they're small, they haven't mated. Once they mate, they get longer and longer abdomen. And virgin queens are really, really quick, really fast. So just from the timing of this split, there should be virgin queen in here. You can see this looks like a queen cell that's been torn down. Lots of nectar coming in. The worker bees are just doing their thing. The forager bees. So if I don't see a virgin queen, that's okay. I may just miss her. Um, what I'll do is wait a week and see what happens. I may even prop this hive up with a little bit more brood. This is definitely a queen cell that's been torn down. So a queen has either emerged out of there or one's been stung through the side and then the workers have torn it down. There's another one, same. It's just got the end. But I'm just looking for a um, virgin queen 
There's another one that's been torn down. That one's been stung through the side. Just there. It's always just really nice to lay eyes on the Virgin Queen so you know she's in there. It's a, just a little bit of a weak period and a vulnerable period for a split when they're trying to get queen right. Because generally with mating, it can be tricky for a new queen. She only flies out once and then returns once. And a lot of the time she won't make it back. She may get eaten by a bird or she just may get lost. She may not get mated well. So it's quite a vulnerable time. Just if you're splitting, you might need to keep monitoring your split box. And just familiarize yourself with the time frames of when the queen will emerge and when she's likely to have mated and when you're likely to have eggs, just keep looking for eggs. But it's basically a month you should see eggs. So this has been three weeks now. So, like I said, if I don't find the virgin, I'll wait another week and I'll give them a little bit of brood just to prop them up. Lots of nectar, you can see it's all coming in underneath this shiny, shiny new nectar. Obviously the queen isn't laying in these cells because there's no queen in here to lay, so they're just filling it with nectar. Here's an interesting thing, the way they draw their wax, they're all festooning off this, they just hang off each other like that and they secrete the wax as platelets from underneath their abdomen and they pass it to each other, they mix it with a little bit of saliva and pass it to each other and that's the way they'll draw those combs. So I'm going to pull them apart here, that's okay. And that's, we had the beginning of one of these in the other frame and this is what they usually do or two or three or even five or six of these little combs and join them together. And they're still looking for the Virgin Queen. Haven't spotted her yet. It's very hard to spot, so it may not. That's okay. Once again, just touching the bees to make a move. You can blow on them if you've got a veil on. Because when you blow, they sometimes shoot out and want to sting in the face. The version's probably not going to be in this little festoon of bees. Oops, we'll have a look anyway. So we might have missed her. She might not be in there. But we'll wait another week and check them out. Give them some brood in the meantime. And see what we see. Is there any more questions, Trace? Yeah, Pete. Uh, Katrina's in Western Queensland, and basically, like a bit like us, says that it's been, it feels like it's been spring the whole of August. Yeah. Um, harvested some honey last week, but it was really quite runny. Just wondering if they should have left it a bit longer. That's quite possible. Um, you may want to check your frames before you harvest, so it's easy to see in the back window if your flow frames have honey in them. But you might want to get in the day before you ten, intend to harvest and just check your actual frames. You pull them out and have a look at the sides of them and see if they're capped or not. Because if they're uncapped, they're probably not quite ready. You may just have to wait another week or so for the bees to dry out that honey and, and um, cap it off. And once it's capped, it won't ferment. So you might if you've got really runny honey, you may want to keep it in the fridge and eat it fairly quickly because otherwise it can ferment and you just taste terrible and you sort of waste it. So honey doesn't go off, but it ferments and um, yeah, you can still eat it, but it really tastes bad. <laughs> and that's what, that's what meat is made from, honey getting fermented. Um, Pete, any suggestions for get, draining out crystallised, hun win crystallised winter honey in the flow frames? Oh, that's a really good question. That's a question for cedar. Um, I have no experience with that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, sorry I can't answer that, but 
maybe um, ask that next week when Seed is on. And um, I know he's yep. he's way more experienced with that because um, you know him and Stu invented these amazing flow frames. So he um, yeah he's got kind of an answer for that, I believe. Nice. Hey, you were talking about the flavour of the honey. Rico is saying that. Um, what can he do with inedible honey? My bees are filling my flow hive with nectar from canola flowers and wild turnip plants. It's very liquid with a really bad taste. Oh, wow. You can I know, just can, get that sometimes, can't you? Bad tasting. You can food. get bad tasting honey, yeah. Um, I know, I know um, commercial beekeepers do make crops of canola honey, but it, it can go crystallise quite quickly. Um, but it is a major source of honey crop for commercial beekeepers. So I'm not sure about the wild turnip. It may be the one making your honey taste bad. So if you harvest it, the way you can kind of use it is just to feed it back to the hive that you harvested it from. You don't want to feed it back to any other hive because that can spread pathogens between hives. But if you've got a jar of honey, punch a couple of holes in the lid, just maybe one or two with a little tiny um, frame, frame nail and upend it over your inner cover like this, boom. On top of the super, it's fine. They'll eat that up, they may store some. Again, you may kind of get that happening, but um, that's kind of the easiest way to do it. You, do, you want to do that in winter, so you can just save that in your cupboard if it doesn't go crystallized, of course. If it does crystallize in your jar, you can put it in hot water and it should go runny again. So that's one way to do it. Um, another, another way may be able to ferment it and turn it into meat, I'm not sure. Um, I've never really had bad tasting honey, so <laughs> it's something I don't know really what to do about. But, um, but you can feed it back to them when they need it in winter time or in, um, around here we get no nectar in late summer when it's really hot. Sometimes the bees need feeding if it's a drought, so I hope that helps. <laughs> uh, nice. Pete Lynette's asking, and obviously it's hot on the news at the moment, all about Varroa mite, um, knowing it's a big problem, and obviously there's mm. all this information on the Department of DPI, Department of Primary Industries. Mm -hmm. But just wondering if you wanted to talk a little about the Varroa mite, or do you just want to refer people to the DPI's website? It's best to check out their website because the situation's changing almost daily. It's really it's just the best thing to do is, is to go straight to the source. And if you're in New South Wales or even Victoria now, um, it's, it's um, really hot on, on the news. And, and the DPI is the Department of Primary Industries in New South Wales. It's the, the body that sort of looks after beekeepers and, and regulates hive movements and all that sort of stuff. So they're um, trying to contain and eradicate the varroa mite incursion in Australia. Australia was the only continent on earth without Varroa, but it's just come to our shores uh, a little while back. So the DPI are really hoping to eradicate Varroa. And yeah, it's best to just go and check their site for any information because it's changing so much. And we can only hope that they can eradicate it. I'm sure they're doing everything they can to do that. So yeah, go to their site and, um, and check it out. Are there any other questions? Yeah, nice. Look, just the last one coming in here from Kathy. Um, has wants to clean her unused boxes for her first nuke. Just how do you re recommend I wash the cedar boxes, and do they need to be painted? The cedar ones um, don't ne really need to be painted. As I've said before, we can move up here to this hive here. It's completely unfinished. We do recommend painting your roof panels here but as you can see they hold up quite well they go a really nice shade of silver and um, around the front here you can see this kind of silvery goldish color um, I've actually my dad's house is clad in red cedar western red cedar the same timber uh, and it's unfinished and it's about 50 years old now and it's looks like this it's fine so the, the western red cedar is a really great timber to hold up in the weather but as I said, do paint your roof um, shingles with house paint. I recommend getting, recommend priming it first and then putting three coats of 
exterior house paint on, color of your choice obviously. And I do recommend painting, like unscrewing your roof panels and painting both sides. You can see with this hive here, both sides are painted. And that just kind of helps with the timber not cupping. So you just remove the, sh the, the shingles and paint both sides and then screw them back on. And in terms of washing, I don't think you really need to wash them. You might need to scrape the wax off them a little bit. Um, never, never really wash boxes much. Um, maybe if you've brush cut around them and the, the sort of grass is sprayed onto them, it can stick to it. You can just get a cloth and, or a scrubber and, and give it a little scrub with some water. Um, but yeah, just soap and water if you, if you need to wash them. And I just scrape off any wax and propolis. It tends to just do the trick. If you leave the wax and propolis on, it's quite fine as well. The bees are attracted to it. Um, but it can actually spread pathogens between colonies too, so just be aware of that. Um, if there's no more questions, um, we might leave it there. Thanks so much for tuning in. We've got a couple of splits done, which is great. And we checked our older split. And talk to you next time.